Hey, welcome everyone to the ARCAD user monthly training webinar. This is Eric Bobro speaking to you from San Rafael, California, and I've got my special guests here, Tracy Stone of Tracy Stone Architect and Mackenzie Lefest. Is that did I get yes. it? <laughs> All right. Welcome, Tracy and Mackenzie. Thank you, Eric. It's uh, great to be here. Excellent. Well, uh, let's make sure everybody can hear us and see us. So go type into the questions box um, that you can see the screen, which has the ARCAD user training webinar on it, and that you can hear us. And uh, all right. Yeah, we're getting that. And just say where you're calling in from, because it's always fun to, to see that. So I see Gerald, Haraldar from Iceland. Excellent. And Scott, Christian, Michael, Daryl. Yeah, a whole bunch of people. I think we're We've got over 100 people on right now. Um, Diane, nice to see you. Um, and uh, Martin from Vienna, and uh, Eric Lutz from South Africa, and uh, wow. Janelle Mamog from Auckland, New Zealand. So we're definitely spanning. Um, and Cairo, Tom, uh, Tom Arcunas in Cairo. So uh, yeah, we're definitely spanning several continents. So uh, <laughs> great. <to see. laughs> So, uh, Tracy, too late for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, a little different than the local Los Angeles user group in terms of you'll be sharing this. Um, so, let me just before you give your introduction to say uh, I'm really pleased, Tracy, to have you on here. Um, we've known each other, I guess, for close to 20 years because you got Archicad in 1999, is what we <clears throat> figured out. Um, so that was 19 years ago. And, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, I think you've really taken to heart the best practices philosophy of just like, how can you use this tool to its most, uh, you know, efficient and useful uh, methods? Uh, what, what can you do to get the most out of it? And uh, I see uh, Mackenzie has really taken that up uh, with full uh, enthusiasm. Uh, I saw the template you know, that you've been developing and uh, the whole presentation that you put together is, I think, going to be very, very useful for a lot of ARCAD users. So welcome, Tracy and Mackenzie. Tell us a little bit about the firm and, and your working together as well. Sure. Uh, so I started my firm in 1991. I was an AutoCAD user, I guess, like many of us, but I was also on a Mac platform. And when uh, AutoCAD stopped supporting the Mac uh, back, I don't know, version 14 or something, uh, I needed a new solution and uh, saw a presentation that I think, Eric, you gave. Um, and it mm -hmm. frankly blew my mind at the time. I'd never heard of such a thing as BIM before. <laughs> it was such a revelation. And I've never looked back. Uh, so um, Mackenzie has been with me for uh, almost seven years. And she was a student of mine, actually, at Woodbury University where I taught a class in ARCHICAD. And she um, then came to work for me, and she has quickly surpassed me in her knowledge of the program. We do, I am very interested in trying to use the program to its fullest capacity, but it's such a massive program, and it can do so much that I know we certainly, uh, you know, scratch the surface of one aspect of it, but I'm always impressed um, when I see these webinars, and certainly your Masters of ARCHICAD um, series, it always presents me with a totally new viewpoint on the program and how other people are using it. So it's really valuable, I think, to, to share this information amongst all of us. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so you, um, you've you been uh, developing your tools, and I guess recently you presented this whole uh, uh, well, this presentation, at least a very quick version of it. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, very quick. <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, today we're going to have the um, pleasure of going through, I guess, your a little bit about the firm and background and your types of projects, taking a look at those. But we'll be focusing primarily on a uh, sort of a tricky part of our KiCad. Um, the I would say that the ability of ARCHICAD to work with complex projects has gradually improved over the years. Uh, you know, I think we all recognize that technology 
marches on, Graphisoft adds more features, but the ability to work with the um, repetitive modules and uh, actually larger chunks of information in a more flexible fashion has uh, just become, um, you know, more and more robust to the point where now it becomes, I wouldn't say trivial, but just much easier to set up. And I think the innovation that um, uh, we saw a couple of years ago, maybe it was three years ago, um, with Karoy Horvath uh, sharing the method of using hotlink modules within a project um, is something that you've taken to heart. And I was delighted to see um, you know, how you've adapted it because you actually have extended it a little bit further than what he was presenting, which was really just single story units. Um, and you've now got townhouses or multiple story um, modules essentially. Uh, so uh, take it away, I'll, I'll uh, be monitoring the questions. So if any of you have questions um, just in general about Tracy's work or what we're showing, uh, type them in. If you need clarification, if there's anything that you, they go through that uh, you know you just wanna see again or you have a uh, sort of a related question, type that in. And I will answer by typing or you know selectively, I'll sort of break into the flow. So uh, take it away. All right, uh, and I'm, we're going to use one project as our, um, to explain this process, but we have some other projects at the end that we can share, or another project to show how this applies uh, in a different way, and it, it can be quite dense. Um, I'm going to first start off with just an overview of the firm and how we've, uh, looking at a few of our projects and how we've used ARCHICAD. Um, but then I'm going to turn it over to Mackenzie to talk about specifically how it applies on this one multi-unit project here in Los Angeles. Um, and we do welcome questions. So with that, uh, as I mentioned, it started in 1999. Um, the first project I'm going to show you is uh, from 2002, <laughs> a very early on uh, project. We've got the ARCHICAD model on the left and the final shots on the right. Obviously, the color proposal didn't fly um, completely with the client, but uh, you know we were modeling in the terrain and, and starting to get a handle on the whole um, form of the project. But at the time, I, I was a little hesitant about uh, really using all of the capabilities to, of the project to provide our documentation. So we were doing a lot of 2D line work. Uh, at that time and not doing as much modeling. So then the next project, uh, again, is a fairly early one, 2004. This was an addition and remodel. And on the left is our model from an early schematic design phase. And on the right is the finished project. So it, it proved to be very useful in helping our clients to see and, and understand the project, and especially with the ability to put in backgrounds and real photos uh, was helpful. Uh, we've also done some historic preservation work, and um, this particular project was a, a renovation or and restoration of a historic carriage house, but the exterior was considered to be historic and the interior was not, so we were able to do some kind of fun things to the inside of the project, and uh, we were really, again, figuring out materials. I think on the bottom left, uh, there is a screen. Uh, a translucent screen that we were working on. And I think it was the first time we made a, a really custom material at that point that had translucency and various project, pro, various um, attributes. So that was fun. Uh, this is another addition and remodel project now from 2009. And we had gotten obviously a, a lot more savvy about the program and the program was kept getting better and better. So. Um, we really took advantage of all of these cutaway views and actually we used um, modules for this project as well to model in the repetitive um, stair, uh, sorry, shelving system. And uh, that worked out quite well. And then we started doing some commercial work and uh, in this particular project, I just wanted to point out the something that was rather tricky and took us a while to figure out how to apply the material with these um, diagonal mitered corners on the surface and how to get 
um, that material to actually look right in um, both the model and in the drawings. And I think we ended up using, um, inserting window openings into the wall in order to get it to meet at that angle. Um, this is kind of a funny project. I threw it in just because um, I thought people might be amused by it. Uh, in the middle is the original building, our site. It's a prefab metal industrial building that our client, Golden Road Brewery, wanted to convert into an English pub. And they were quite serious about the English pub um, aesthetic. And so you can see on the left our model. Uh, actually, I believe Oops. this has been taken into a Atlantis. Atlantis rendering, and on the right is the is the space. And um, we really tried to use uh, Archicad uh, a lot um, more intensively than we had to date in modeling these very specific benches using complex profiles. We were able to take specific stained glass windows that he wanted to insert. Yeah, in the project and to model the stained glass in as a custom window and, and doing various things. We had um, all kinds of paneling details and things that uh, Archicad was very helpful at uh, rendering and, and defining for construction. Um, we've also been doing a lot of work for developers and this is a, a single family house, a spec house that we did. Um, and you can just see the model at the top left and the finished photo. Um, and one of the kind of funnier aspects about this project is that the bottom left represents the aesthetic for this project all the way through plan check, at which point our client decided that he wanted it to be modern instead. But with Archicad, we were able to just change the materials to a certain degree. We made a few design changes, but um, Right in the middle of plan check, we went back with a totally modern house in place of this more Cape Cod house. And our plan checker didn't bat an eyelash. Uh, he was perfectly fine with this. And I think to a certain degree, um, the fact that we just could work on you know, changing finishes on the surface um, and the modeling was in many ways similar was very helpful. And this is for the same client. And um, again, you might notice that the top images look very similar to the last one you saw. And I, I suspect many of you have run into this as well, where the client says, well, gee, that was a fine design on that last site. Why don't we just do it again? But many different conditions. Um, but nevertheless, the front got recycled, but without wood this time. So uh, <laughs> we have a, a different house in the back. You see the schematic design on the bottom left and how it actually finished out. He, uh, over time, got scared of wood and other finishes, and it just became about stucco. So that brings us to the heart of this presentation, which is as we've moved on and, and been working on more and more different types of projects, um, we started finding the need for, or that we had repetitive modules or repetitive instances. In the bottom, there's a commercial uh, tenant improvement building for a uh, television production studio who had a whole series of identical editing bays that they wanted to build out. And on the top is a just a four unit apartment building, but the two interior units are identical. And we realized we needed some sort of method to manage these. Um, I should go to the next slide. We've also been working on a project type that is I know, very specific to Los Angeles. I think there may be some a few other cities that are considering this. Uh, I'm not entirely clear how, across the world whether other countries are doing it, but basically uh, the city enacted a law, the small lot subdivision law, that allows you to take a lot that is zoned for multifamily uses to subdivide it into very small lots and to put single family homes on that lot with no setbacks between them. So they're, they're like uh, row houses, let's say on the east coast of the United States. Um, where each one is independent structurally. They don't share a wall, but they butt right up against each other. And uh, a successful site plan, as far as the developer is concerned, often has 
um, as many as possible repeats of the same house so that, um, you know, you're really only documenting a few of these, even though you may be developing six, seven, 11, 12 houses. So again, this need for repetitive modules, but this is where we got into the question of how do you bring a module in and set it at a different height. So each house, as you grade across the site, even the one on the left, the back houses are about two feet higher than the front house for grading purposes. So how do we manage a repeat um, that, that may step up a little bit or that can be placed precisely, um, but still uh, only be documented once? So as Eric mentioned, we saw a master's in architecture, Archicad, uh, excuse me, lecture by Kuroi, and uh, a light bulb went off because we had been working with Graphisoft and a number of different consultants and asking questions and trying to come up with the best way to handle it. And we tried a whole range of different solutions, but um, we finally came down to two. I think this is the next slide. So one on the left is to treat this as an external module where the entire building, all the floors of it, are built out in a separate ARCHICAD file and then placed in the site file as a single Sorry. module. Just a minute. And the other one, um, which was Croy's method, was to locate an internal module on another story and then bring it up to the site um, and place it as needed. So we have generally um, decided that this internal module direction is the one that we wanted to pursue. And that's what we're going to be talking about here today. So I'm going to turn it over now to Mackenzie <laughs> to explain the, the specifics of this method and how we are using it in uh, primarily these small lot subdivision projects at the moment. So uh, this file that we have open today, and this is this is a completely live file um, that I can we can scroll around and show you that we have the settings set up in this file. Um, but this one is is a, per, a relatively flat lot, and as Tracy mentioned, we also have um, another project open that we can kind of skim through at the end. That is a more complex lot that slopes pretty steeply up. Um, and it's sometimes hard to document when you're trying to take a, a floor plan, but it varies um, on the site. Um, so this one, for example, this is, we call this the site. And this is everything up here is the placed module. Um, and then the live modules are actually living, we call it downstairs, is kind of our internal slang. Um, but the live, the live pieces, the live components actually live in negative stories. And as you can see over here on um, our, our project map, we have negative stories and we go through type A, B, there's no type C in this particular project. Um, but then we, we show a buffer range between so that you can really define um, e each unit as its own. And these, you're looking at, at live views from the model so you can actually see the relationship. Those are the units down below and you see them over here in elevation as well. Yeah, I went ahead and opened it actually. So you can see there, there are the 3D models of each unit type, a type A, and this is a type B. And then up here, everything is a, um, it's a place module. So each, you end up placing each story individually. Um, so one of the ways you have to deal with these is, is filtering the information so that you're not completely bombarded and, and seeing the entire layer system at once. Can you, um, can you zoom in on, on that <clears throat> section that shows all of the dialogue boxes? Yes, sure. So one of the things that you can do for kind of your 3D views, and we, we often will save a, some sites views. So there's a sites 3D view, which only includes the site information. And this goes for all of our other uh, views too. And then each type will have its own set of 3D views that only show type A, type B. So you're not, you don't have the whole complex thing, but it's, um, you can filter the information in 3D by view elements in 3D, filter and cut elements in 3D, and um, then go and um, use this drop down to, to figure out what zone you actually want to show information in. Another way to do it, so for your section, sections and elevations, for example, you can use the, the 
section settings to decide whether you want to show all of it or just your section um, and, and use the, the vertical range to limit your view on those two. So early on in the design process, it the um, we often will start just on the side. It gets really complex the minute you start pulling them down into the modules. So when we're doing really base layouts, something that's very easily replicable, which is just fill zones, that sort of thing, we'll do it just on the site and um, keep it pretty quick and simple at the top. But then once we have, for example, a site layout, that is what time is that's the time we start to bring it down to the module level and develop the site, the floor plans down there, where you can you only then end up doing one set of floor plans instead of, you know, for example, this one would have been four. Um, so that it's at that point when you start to move into the floor plans or the, the 3D design that you're going to move it down to the modules. And I, I will say it then allows you to, to quickly get a sense of the complex. The minute that you move those modules, once you've, you've done your schematic design down below uh, on that one module, uh, and then I'm always the one telling Mackenzie, okay, let's place it, let's place it. So, because the minute that you start to replicate them around, immediately, you know, you see the whole the impact of the whole complex, but you've really only made one model or one, modeled one unit. I quickly just saw someone was asking if it's a 21 feature. This, the, the modules, the module um, component to ARCHICAD has been around for a long time. So it's, it's, it was in that project that Tracy mentioned in 2009, they were using modules for some little boxes, and while those are very minor, it's the same concept, it's the same tool. So we're just expanding on using that tool. Although, it, Eric, I think maybe you can speak to this. It was our understanding from Kuroi that initially the internal module was only available on teamwork projects. And then we're finding, I didn't hear specifically that they changed that, but we are finding now that that's no longer true. We can do it on an individual project as well. Yeah, that, that's what Karoy said at the time, <clears throat> and I tested it not too long after on a standard PLN and found that it worked. So I'm not sure at what point they changed it, but it's it, it had changed at least two or three versions ago um, to to work very beautifully. Um, one thing that I'm sure you're going to explain is when you when you place a hot linked module, you can choose to to place an entire file or just a story of a file. And um, the limitation here is that each story has to have only one unit type. You can't have unit types A and B next to each other because then you won't be able to selectively place um, yeah. A and B uh, separately. Uh, so you can't Unless use a marquee. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to explain explaining it. But other than that, it is awesome um, because it keeps it makes it faster and it keeps all of your attributes the same. So if you change the definitions of wall types or materi building materials or surfaces, um, they are all integrated. Now, there are a few questions that have come up. Um, we might as well, since I've jumped mm -hmm. in here, how large is this file? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can easily tell you. I'll have to find this file. Give me, give me a minute, but you can uh, ask another question. Um, okay. Uh, question from Ryan says, are you going to post a recording of this? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Lawrence was asking about, did I did you rotate the live model within a layout? And the answer is no. You had, it in behind it, you had already opened up the source of the drawing, yeah. which was a 3D window view. You know, it's just basically a particular viewpoint on the 3D with the right layers and and, and things like that. So, um, right. but what was interesting to me and wasn't obvious right at first is the fact that yeah, the the real design is goes from zero on up or whatever level on up. The other elements down below are your modules, and they are literally, if you don't restrict your view, you will see the unit types down below. So that's uh, right. you know, quite quite something. Um, yeah, like for example, you can see in our and at this uh, elevation. So all of these up here are modules, um, and then just in the stories below are the the individual um, units. And right. for us, we often will build the first the the module down below sits in a location of one of the real ones up above. It, it just 
So uh, you can, it's, uh, it's easy. Trace reference, go down, and you at least have one that has a, has a real reference on the site above. Um, so I know you briefly mentioned, or we can expand upon the two different types of modules, and you were saying that we place modules by story. Um, that, so the benefit of doing an a separate file, an external module, is that you can place an entire unit, right? So you're only placing one where we are placing four times eight, we're placing 32 modules, for example. Um, where when you have it in the same file, though, the benefit of doing that is it's really easy to find the information. You can just go down, go downstairs and change something live and update it back up to the site versus going to a separate file. So instead of having multiple files open at the same time, you're doing one file. And I did look, it, it is, it's a large file. So <laughs> um, it's 380 megabytes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, so these files are going to be large no matter what. So whether we're doing them internal or external or you're doing all the documentation, you're still going to have the same amount of saved views. You're still going to have the same amount of documentation. So the file is going to be inherently large no matter what. Okay. So um, there have been, um, you know, questions saying, can we see this in action? So I'm sure you're going to um, yeah. do that. And uh, uh, what I would suggest, if, if, maybe you already have a plan, but, you know, just place separately one of those stories off to the side, you know, an instance of it, yeah. and then also make at least some small change in it, like even just put in 2D lines somewhere on it and just show how the 2D lines propagate everywhere. Um, then then that'll be obvious. But the other question is, um, can you have modules within a module? This is uh, Mikhail van den Dolder says that. Um, so I, I can't imagine that you, that it would be a problem if you had a negative story that was, let's say just the bathroom, you know, that you had the same bathroom in unit A and unit B, just uh -huh. to, you know, B or, or for whatever reason, you could have that module linked into the unit module right, and, and then module. that one that one can go up to um, you know to the actual site uh, model um, and there is an option that you, I'm sure you're going to show about uh, or you can show about uh, nesting in other words yeah. you're going to choose whether to include nested modules or not so uh, Mikhail I, um, I hope that at least gives you an idea of how we think that we can approach it maybe you've maybe you've done this Mikhail so um, all right, and yeah. Lazaro says, can you please show the previous slide again? So, um, so uh, part of that. This, this okay, guy. and zoom, zoom, in, zoom in a little bit on that. So thank you. All right, I'm going to let you go on and demonstrate because uh, I think there's a lot to show, and, and uh, but people are really excited about it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's very complex, and um, so it may go over some of your heads. Some of you are, may already know how to use this, so we may be preaching to the choir here. Um, so when back to the basics of you want to place a module, it's kind of like an object, you're placing it um, into your file. File, it's external content and place hot link module. And this is the point where um, you're gonna, you can give it a master ID and I can talk a little bit about benefits of master IDs later um, and, and using that and pulling information and schedules. Um, but this is where you ought, we ought, we will remove the top link. We want it to be, in, we want to keep all the information, the story settings of where it's originally located in, and it can just be placed um, wherever it needs to be on the site to look correct or to be in the correct location. And then mm -hmm. when you choose, um, choose hot links, so for example, uh, so when you choose the hot link, you can choose your own file, you can choose um, another file, you can choose a teamwork file, for example. Um, so Right now, this file is a, a solo project, but we often have projects that are teamwork files, and you can go and just relink to the exact same um, teamwork file or solo file, however you uh, end up doing that. Um, and as, as um, Eric noted about uh, nested modules, I'll, I'll go over those in a second, but there's an option to include or exclude the nested modules. So when you're going to, ex um, to link, we can just click new hot link and you're either going to choose a, from a regular solar file or a teamwork file and it'll just open a dialog box to, to link to that. Um, so just to show you how it, it works in real life, um, this for example is a module and it's the second story of this unit for example. I can delete and this is 
link to another unit, but I can go and file place. And I often recommend just doing everything on the ARCHICAD layer. Um, anything that is that comes in, for example, the walls, the furniture, and all that, it will keep all these same layers um, as the original file as it was drawn. So the wall, if you draw the walls on a wall exterior, exterior, when you place it in the module, it will still be a wall exterior, even though your um, hot link module will show as being on the ARCHICAD layer. So when you link, I'm going to place the type A second floor, which is the one I just deleted, and OK, and place. And it looks, it's slightly off, but um, I can place it, and I often will just use kind of trace reference. It does take a little bit of, just to get the units placed in the right, like, right location, it, it does take a little bit of time at the beginning, but then once they're placed, it's really kind of flawless and that you don't have to worry about things moving because they will, as long as they don't move downstairs, they're not going to move upstairs either. So, um, like I said, we'll often use trace reference to place them, and I will just go and um, snap to a corner that I know lines up. And then there it's replaced in its proper location. <laughs> okay. Um, there was one other thing too is just to be mindful when you're placing these. Um, there is a option. Oops, sorry. External content place hotlink module. There is an option to change the elevation. Personal preference of mine is actually to not adjust it in this dialog box, although if you know exactly where it's supposed to be, you can certainly do that. Um, and I often will place it as zero and then either go in 3D or in a section or elevation and adjust the height that way um, so that you know it's exactly aligning where you're, you're intending the walls and the floor to align and it kind of snaps together. And that's important if you're, um, it, it could be that on your site file, story two represents a bit of an abstract concept because the back units might be located two feet or three feet above story two. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes just setting it at story two is not sufficient depending on how you've got the modules, uh, all of the different units located on the site. So, um, as we talked briefly, uh, we have another file open, and it's actually in construction documents right now. So it's live; it's a live file. It's it's in progress, um, but I can open it up after this uh, presentation or at the end of this one. And it's we we do have projects that go up a hillside, for example, and you know the the finished floor of one is about five feet higher than the the previous one, and it gets it can get tricky. Um, making sure everything shows right if you're doing a site plan right at the top, but um, that kind of leads into how we do the, um, well, in a, in a little bit we'll talk about all the documentation for um, how, how we take that for each unit. But before we do that, the nested modules, um, as, as I pointed out, there's a nested modules thing, and Anytime that you have a unique condition that may not apply to every unit or it may be um, different for, for different units. So, for example, these back units, this is a driveway down the middle. And we, while we want a patio door to go out to the patio in the side yard, a door is probably not appropriate on the driveway. So, for in this instance, we, wanna, um, we wanted the door on one and a window on the other. And what we did, because this was so simple, we actually just placed... Um, uh, a separate wall on the site. So this is not part of the module and the module is is missing this element. So if we go down to the site or the module level, this this wall does not exist. Um, and we just place them on the site. Another way of doing that, if it's a little more complex or if you have um, a, lot. A, lot, a lot of things that are going on. So for another project, we had a whole entry that changed between the two and it was a uh, it was a, some steps up and it had a overhang. trellis and yeah. overhang, right? Um, and we did those as nested modules. And what you can do is you can you can build them in the in a in the module file and then save them as a separate module and place them back in so you know everything's aligning 
and then they end up being two elements and you can choose to bring them in together or you can bring them in separate um, through that nested module option on the um, checkbox. I'll just make one point here. There's a question from someone who's a newbie asking, is a module like a block in AutoCAD? And I responded saying, <clears throat> sort of like a block, but it's more like an XREF because the elements are still individual. In other words, you can still select uh -huh. the walls or windows or whatever. They're locked because they're basically controlled by the source, in this case, on the negative story could be in another file, um, which mm -hmm. means that they get updated if the design gets developed further or changed. And a key thing, when you drew that extra wall, it cleaned up. It didn't just sort of bump into it. It actually had a clean intersection, just like two normal walls that would meet at the corner. And that's a very, very key, um, well, distinction isn't quite the right word, but a key feature mm -hmm. is that the modules, while they are updatable and have all of the benefits of that. They also participate in schedules. They participate in cleanup. They, you know, they're, they're just essentially normal elements that are being controlled from a central place. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a great that's really good point. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, and so once, once we start making changes and I know, uh, you asked us to, to look at how we change something and how it gets updated. So I can actually do that right now. So for example, these are the, the type B units. And um, you know, say we want to uh, move, the, move the bed. Over, you know, to this side of the room, you know, um, you can, you can save that. That this is a key thing. This is actually a, a nice tip. So in order to update it, you have to save it in the file first. Otherwise, the file doesn't know it exists. <laughs> um, so once you, you have to save the overall file first, and then you can update the modules so that it's it's updating an up-to-date item. So yeah. may I just jump in there uh -huh. just to clarify that? it Basically, the module, while it's in the live file that um, – uh, you know, you're working in, the module is actually referencing the disk version of the file. So that's why you have to save your file in order for the updates to be uh, picked up. Now, you know, how long did that take? I don't know, 15 seconds or something like that to do a save um, and an update. If you go to Hotlink Manager, just see how long that takes uh, to do that. Um, so there's a little bit of overhead there, but frankly, you don't have to do it for every little change. I mean, like you might be working on the module and doing a bunch of things for 10 minutes or an hour, whatever it is. And then when you want to see it percolated, uh, propagated, et cetera, that's when you need to make sure you save. Um, so you don't have to do it every two minutes. You can do it at the time that you want to see the updates. Right. And that's that's kind of key. It, when people often ask, oh, is that time consuming to update it every time? Um, you, you learn to be smart about not updating it, like, like Eric said, after every single design change or, you know, when you're in documentation doing after every single thing. You kind of can work and do a lot of massing things and then update it and it updates it uniformly. I, I will say that uh, it's we found this is one of the benefits, actually, of working in the internal module is the update process, if you're in an external one, is that ARCHICAD has to either open each of those files uh, in order to link to it and, and update, um, or you have to have all of those files open at the same time. So we, it just came down to, we found that this actually is a more efficient process. So uh, updating a module, if you guys saw, but I was, I was going file, external, hot, or external content, hotlink manager. Um, and one thing about this is I hadn't actually relinked these hotlinks back to this file. So any time that you file and change the file or file save as and change the file name or or whatever, and you need to relink, it's not a big deal, really isn't. Um, so you can just relink from file or teamwork file. This is the project we're working in, for example. Um, select and then it's relocating and it will automatically update. Or you can just select the update button um, and it will now it's updating. So while you're doing that, so <laughs> the idea of re uh, save, changing the name of the file 
um, as you go is an interesting thing. I see you say um, you had the name of the file with V20. So I guess this is all in Archaea 20 right now. <laughs> this particular project is in 20, and it, the reason we haven't updated it is it uh, it's in construction now. So it's done. we it's we don't want to take it to 21 for these last few minor things that may or may not <laughs> happen during construction. But if the project was you know construction documents at this point, we'd probably move it on along to 21. Um, right. I'm a big big yeah. advocate. Move yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So my best practice is recommendation just in general is, uh, and I'm sure there are pros and cons to it, is keep the project name the same all the way through. Peel off copies both for backup, you know, archival copies of, uh, you know, like when you submit to the city or at different phases, milestones, et cetera. But if you keep the name of the actual working file the same, you have two benefits. One is you never have a question of which one is it. Is it, you know, Smith Project latest file, Smith Project final version, Smith Project, you know, for printing, you know, you don't have that question. It's always just Smith Project. Um, but then also um, you don't have to update these hot links, these internal ones, because it's always the same one. But do, of course, make copies both, you know, like on your time machine or your other backup, maybe up in the cloud, and then, you know, sequential ones like the one from April 5th or April 8th or or whatever just make copies of the file and then you're more you're secure yeah, yeah that, um, that would definitely work too and in all fairness it's taking a minute to uh, relink the file it's not normally this long <laughs> to update uh, when it's just a, a simple it's update linked, when it's yeah. already linked correctly um, it, it normally is you know it's a, it's a minute maybe um, but it's not quite this yeah so we, we saved right. a copy for this presentation, which is <laughs> we forgot to do all this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. That's David fun. has the question: Are the copies the same name? And I was just uh, saying you could name archival copies like Smith Smith Project City Submittal or Smith Project um, uh, you know permit drawings or Smith Project April fifth, etc. Those would be the copies, but it would be Smith Project all the way through, um, at least in that scenario. Um, uh, Lawrence asks, what's the difference between a hot link module and a nested module? A nested module is one inside the other. So you would have, let's say you had a, a bathroom module that is going to be seen in maybe unit type A and B. And it's, you know, for, it actually is going to be exactly the same. Um, then you might as well have that bathroom as a module that goes, gets put into the larger ones. And the same way, if you have a multi-story high rise, you could have, whether it's units or offices or other repetitive things within a story, and then that story becomes a module that you repeat five or 10 or 100 times, you know, for as many yeah. stories as the floor plate is constant. So nested is sort of a hierarchy of things that are included. And you could go multiple levels. I mean, two is common like a bathroom in a unit plan, but you could even have some, a, a third or fourth level if you needed. Uh, so other questions that have come in, um, are the modules created originally on a negative story or are they their own project file and then brought in? And the answer is both ways work. We're looking right now at the negative story version. In other words, just uh, having made some design changes, uh, design decisions about the footprint and the basic design things, it was then copied down to a negative story to be developed into a module. And then that those elements that just happen to be sitting way below the main project uh, elevation are then, uh, are then referenced as a module. So saying, hey, we want to put in a module. It's the negative eighth story from this building. So that's they start out as regular elements. They become a module when they're placed in yes, yes. the content. We were just, oh. I was just confirming with Mackenzie, you do not have to save these as a module. There's there's no, you don't, ha it doesn't have to be a .mod file. Um, we're literally referencing the same PLN file as the, the sites and the modules are all located on the same PLN file or the same teamwork project. They don't have to be individual um, file names. Yeah. Have you shown, uh, I, I may have missed it, but have you shown just placing one of these um, I did. Yes, I, yeah. I deleted one and replaced it. Um, well, just so. just place a new one off to the side, just just to sure. show how that works. So, file external content place hotlink module, 
And these are the ones that are already referenced in the file, so um, it'll be pretty easy to just place one of those. And I place. Yeah. And and there it goes. Okay. And the one step you skipped in there was just where you choose what the module is, because this is one that already is there. So can you just show how you would choose yep. uh, a new thing? Because this would be what you do when you're doing it for the first time. You choose hot yeah, when you're, So when you first start a file um, and you're, you're kind of starting from scratch, you're going to have to first locate all of them. And that's just choose hot link and then new hot link. And you can choose, you know, file and select your file, or you can select a teamwork file. And um, and when you do that, for example, select, it'll come up with this uh, dialog box, and you can you can choose which story you want. It gives you the option to do all stories, but in this particular instance, when we're doing internal, <laughs> you definitely do not want to do all stories. You're doing a single story at a time that are just are conveniently located on top of each other. And it does not give you the option to do a selected group of stories, yeah, as far as I know, which would be nice. But It's one at a time or all of them. So if you're doing the external module option where it's an external file, and we do have files like that in our office, um, that's when you would be doing all stories because you can bring in the entire house or the entire um, multi-story unit through this, through this option. Okay. Um, so let's see, integrate the zones and the dimensions in the module. So you're going to be showing when you do things in the module and when you do things in the, yeah. the context of the full building site. Um, they, Michael asks, can I see a cross section, please? So at some point, bring that up. I want to see how you handle all the different floor levels. So you're going to be showing that. Um, and so um, the question, you're not creating MOD files in this case. Um, you can, but it's it, the advantage here is you don't actually have to. Um, and is the process of generating internal modules any different than of external ones? We just saw that the internal ones you're referencing a file on disk that happens to be this file, mm -hmm. and you're then picking a story. Um, you could pick another file, reference a story or the entire thing, but in this case, it's the same file. And then Nasser says, I have 15 modules in my project. Every time I register, I have to update all the modules and it takes a lot of time. So can you just bring up, there is a, um, uh, a, a control that they've in enhanced under the work uh, options menu or work environment. Uh, yep, you're gonna have to show me where you. And it's <laughs> under data safety, data safety and integrity, oh. and. Uh oh, this. Hmm. <laughs> is it uh, used to being on another window? There it is. Okay. Um, so if you go down to data safety and integrity, about midway down. So there is an option now for hot link update. Now press down on that where it says check hot links. Yes. So this is a really useful thing, Nasser. You can say, you know what? I'm just going to manage this myself. Just Archicad, ignore them. I will take care of them. You can also say, uh, check hot links and ask for update confirmation, which is the default. It's saying every time you open the project, it'll say, hey, uh, you know, you have some hot links out of date. Um, and then there's another one which just says check and update hot links automatically in a small project. And maybe in the early stages, you might just say, hey, you know, whenever I open it, you know, just bring it up to date. Don't even ask me, you know, so that's, but ignore hot links is something that now you can say, hey, just don't bug me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's the automatically check status. Sorry, there was a, oh, a checkbox there um, in the same, uh, same place. Automatically check status of the hot links. Um, in the hotlink manager when you bring up the hotlink manager it now will say in the default is to say uh manual checking you know and it won't it'll it'll say i don't know whether they're up to date that saves time because you might just say oh i only need to check this one in other words maybe you have 10 modules and you don't need to have it go and look at all of them but you could in a small project just say hey just show me if anything's out of date you know yeah and we actually, I think I, we turned these off because it, it did get sometimes a little annoying where the, the dialog box says, oh, are you ready to update? Oh, are you ready to update? Like, no, I'm not quite ready to update. Give me a, give me a few more steps. Um, 
but you can you can definitely change that per project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll let you go on. There's a few more questions here, but um, I think uh, I'll let you <laughs> move forward. I'm sorry for interrupting too much. No, it's fine. Um, okay. So next, probably a lot of you have questions on documentation. So we have tried many different methods, and this is kind of one of those things where you have to determine what's the best way to do documentation per project. Um, for a relatively flat site, such as this project this, that we're, they're actually working on today, um, it, it worked really well for us to take all the documentation at the site level. Um, the, the notes, for example, and the window labels, everything is really located down in the downstairs in the, in the live area, and everything that is on the site is really just the module. So um, all these notes are downstairs, all of the, the window labels are downstairs, all of the text is downstairs. And when you place a module, it will bring the 2D documentation and dimensions and um, that sort of thing with it. You know, I actually realized that we didn't discuss mirroring the module, but clearly, as you can see there on the left, it's the same module and it's mirrored. And it's a very simple process, actually, to mirror them. Just like you would, um, you can do it as easy as just uh, mirroring an object, how you, you know, control M. Um, you can mirror a, a module as well. It, it acts kind of like a, an object when you're, when you're using it in the, in the file. Um, another way to do it, if, if you have a complex project and you're worried about notes overlapping or it gets really kind of too much information, too rich of information doing it side by side, um, we do take some of the documentation down at the site level. Um, and often we'll do this, especially when we have a varying floor level and you, you have some trouble figuring out what should and shouldn't be on the floor plan. So, for example, the unit to the right, maybe not necessary or you know that's one way to mitigate that whole problem is just taking the documentation at the module level and doing all the notes and text and layers or anything that might overlap if it's when you took it upstairs um, just putting those on a specific layer to this so for example they, we have a layer on this the project on the right that um, was for example unit B fills unit B text unit B whatever, and then through layer combinations, filter that information so that when you took the plan at the lower level, it looked correct, and then it, you could turn those layers off when they were next to each other so they didn't overlap up on the site level. Um, we often, I would say 99 100% of the time we take all sections and elevations actually up at the site. The thing about sections and elevations is this information does not transfer from the bottom to the top. So while the notes and floor plan will, the notes and dimensions and labels do not come with it in section and elevation or 3D, for example. That um, the documentation point, the documentation portion for this is all up at the site level. And just in case it wasn't obvious, the mesh, the earth, lives up at the site level. And you definitely don't want to build that down below as well. So it's only at the site that you start to see the relationship of these modules to their to the adjacent grade. Yes. Um, so, for example, both of those projects I showed with the floor plans, they were both taken at the site. And we'll often put a you know, a 50% um, fill over the adjacent structure so that you can see that they exist, they, they sit side by side and how they interact and you can really see that relationship um, up on the site, but it mutes them so that you can still have a documentation for unit B um, and not get too, too complicated. Um, so the next thing is, um, we try really hard to automate a lot of our processes and information. So um, we use zones or fills a lot and we'll do our calculations and pull our schedules from those zones and fills. So for example, um, for Los Angeles, we have to do, I don't know, a handful of 
floor area calculations in different manners. And some of them are for the assessor area or the school district fee, and some are for the zoning code area, and you're regulated by some and not others, and you get credits in some and not others. Um, so we actually will do a zone for each type, and um, we haven't gotten to the point where we actually do zones for rooms and, and label doors and windows with the zones. That's a little one step above us right now. <laughs> um, but we do all of our area calculations. And then um, so we place them all on the downstairs. So we're placing still everything in the type B, uh, the module downstairs of the live area. And then we can use our schedules to pull that information. So um, we placed all those zones, and now each story has its own zone. And um, we filter the information. So we call out the zone, we call out the layer, and then we actually say, you know, we only want to show the information that is downstairs. We don't want to show five type A's. We want one on this table, for example. Um, and then We'll use the measured area and calculated area to kind of give ourselves the credit. So, for example, in the garage where it's not counted for the assessor, um, we will give ourselves a 100% credit um, on the zone calculation, or it's technically 99.99 because it doesn't understand 100%. Um, and it will then subtract the area and the calculation there, and we just manually type in the credit. So we see that we were giving ourselves the credit, but um, it, it will give us kind of the before and after numbers. Same with uh, door schedule. So those zones that we just showed you with the floor area calcs, um, we actually use those same zones to pull our uh, door and window schedules and label them um, appropriately, and we, or filter them appropriately. So we can, give me a minute. <laughs> I think this is because of all the hot lights, right? You have to read and everything. Um, it might be. Um, so what we do is we, just like we use the floor area calcs, we, um, we, we filter the doors and windows down. So it's only showing, you know, everything below the existing site and we put a header and it filters. So type A and it will list all the doors and windows and I'll say type B and all the doors and windows. Um, I do know, um, and I've been talking to Graphisoft, uh, tech support on this, but, um, I think it's in the next... Um, update that they they have a little bit of a glitch um, in ARCHICAD 21 and we're finding that on another project um, where it doesn't, even though the zone is overlapping internal doors, interior doors, it's not picking up those doors correctly. So there are some workarounds that we've figured out and we will then just change our, our filter to be above the um, above the existing side or up at the side and we just merge the uniform items so we don't have to see, you know, five unit A's, we only see one unit A, and, and it's door list. Yeah. Apologize for this delay, I think, because we had to relink. So yeah, yeah, and so for example here, and I will zoom out just so you can kind of see the whole list, um, but the, it filters per the zone up there, and we, I was telling uh, Eric this yesterday, this project was right when the whole properties thing came out and we got really excited about the properties. So we started creating properties for everything. Um, and we have all the drop down menus that we've created all the custom options for, you know, what kind of doors and windows we want and, you know, whether it's self closing or not, or what the fire rating is and all that kind of fun stuff. So, um, that was kind of a fun addition for us to start using in the settings. And like I mentioned here, we're, we don't, we were showing this below the first story. So we didn't want it to be any hot link. We wanted it to be everything below there. So it's, it's pulling up the live information on type A and the live information from the doors and windows on type, type B. And let's see, what's next? I think that's it. Um, I know this might, some of you, your eyes may be rolling back in your heads. A little, a little dense information, but um, we're happy to answer some questions. Uh, anybody else has anything oh, else? Oh, I think, I think we have a bunch of questions typed <laughs> in, and so let me, and, and uh, uh, because I was so furiously typing things, I, the last few minutes of it, I didn't follow very closely. So, you know, I may ask you to show something that you've already shown, but, um, 
Uh, did you show a section through the whole building? A section? I can surely show you one. Um, yeah. So, caveat here. So, we often will do a site, se site a set of site sections so that you get uh, a, a grip on how they're relating on the site. So, I'll open one of those real quick. And these are just, this is, this is a section and it's taken only at the site and it will be, um, it'll be looking at all of the linked modules. We had obviously some underground vaults problems <laughs> going on here. Um, but these are the modules, right? So, With, so, it has a square on the corner, that means it's a module. Right, okay. So yeah, so what we're seeing here is a bunch of elements in proximity, the way it's gonna look when it's built. Um, each story, in a unit is a module. So if you just select that again, um, you know, or one of the other ones. Yeah, so that's, these are the repetitions there. Then you have some things like the mesh, the train, and I guess the roadway and things like that that are just the site um, itself. And you probably, you, you do have those individual walls in certain rare cases where they are just fitting into the actual context and they're not part of the module. Yeah. Um, now, the notation here, uh, uh, right now we're not seeing much in the way of notation, but your comment was that the um, uh, intersection or elevation of the site, it doesn't bring in anything from the units other than the, the 3D, the actual building. So you're going to notate that in that context. You're going to put dimensions yes. and notes. So here we have a section with this, some notes here. Site. So we have these modules again, but all of this is is live documentation. And I know I'm slightly cheating here, um, showing kind of the floor lines, but that's kind of one of those things you learn how to work around things. And so when you have uh, buildings that are varying in height, your floor level, for example, may not necessarily be at zero on the story setting. on the story settings. So we will often do kind of uh, some hand documentation or um, some independent documentation for stories in this condition. Whereas if I were to, I'm going to move down now, I'm going to move downstairs to the same section, but down with the live elements. And these are where the, we have all the live story settings that we use and we adjust the heights here. Um, one thing to note, this is kind of something I've learned and Eric thought he may know it, a, a, different way of doing it, or I'm, I may be not doing it correctly, um, but we were having trouble at one point um, adjusting the story settings. And one of the main reasons that we locate a buffer between the stories, so I'll show you in our story settings, we have a buffer between them, and I kind of use that to help mitigate so if things kind of drop down below a story or kind of extend, you don't get you know portions of type B when I'm looking at type A's documentation. But also when you're adjusting story settings, I we highly recommend um, editing the stories one by one. Um, and that way it kind of gets absorbed anytime that you move up or down, it gets absorbed into the buffer area. Um, whereas sometimes if you do the same story and all above, it would, I tried it once and it, it moved a bunch of my elements up on the site and that was kind of disaster. So I have kind of since made a, a, a internal rule for the office that we're only going to edit the stories one by one to maintain, you know, these are independent units and they don't affect the other ones or cause issues in, in the units elsewhere. Okay. So um, you have a project that has the stepped situation. Yeah. Uh, did, did you have that open as well? That was. Uh... Yeah. yeah. And this, and th this has been a challenge. We <laughs> acknowledge um, this one is in 21, by the way. And uh, some of the the stair um, information has been really challenging to show in a overall site plan view. Right. So, like I mentioned, we often take our so our full construction documentation plans um, will often be down at the live level at the at the type level in the downstairs. Um, but we'll it's often nice to have you know an overall floor plan, right? Um, so. You really have to work on this, but if you go through, I found, um, excuse me, and make the walls um, symbolic cut, it helps in that no matter where you cut it or no matter where the cut plane is, 
every wall is going to look solid. And then we will do um, short walls or low walls, things that you don't want cut as um, uh, outlines, outlines, outlines only when that's usually like a, a roof deck or a guardrail, that kind of thing where it's low and we don't want to cut through. That's mm -hmm. how we've yeah. worked around that. And, and just so you know, this is the first floor, obviously, of all units, but that unit on the far right there, 5, 10, 15, it, 20, 25, 30 feet higher, the, the finished floor is 30 feet higher than the, the unit on the left. So, so yeah, so this, of, this is a rather symbolic view, yeah, really, if you, if you think about it. <laughs> It's, it's showing them just so that you can understand that the ground floor is similar. The, the middle units are all the same. The end units are slightly different um, uh, because of their context. Um, but really, if we think about an architectural drawing normally, you're cutting through at some height and you're trying to show the vertical relationships, what's in this vertical zone. Right. But this is a symbolic representation um, that, of course, makes sense to us when we're thinking about, well, there's how many units do you have and what's the ground floor of each unit? So yeah, this is an alternate thing. It's funny, Eric, we just ran into this on one of our projects where there's a community design overlay requirement that you have to have a site plan that shows the location of all the windows. And so when you have one like this where you're on so many different sites, rather than generating, you know, empty um, number of, of plans that are basically showing them exactly as they would be cut. It's much quicker to show it this way so they can see all the first floor windows, all the second floor windows and so on. Right, but it has been right. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. often our, our consultants too will ask, uh, yeah, we wanna see the buildings as they hit the ground. You know, the civil engineer doesn't care what's going on above. They just wanna know where are the walls when they're touching the ground. So these these kind of plans help with the the consultants that we often work with. So, so let, let me let me just again make it clear because I think this is such a critical thing. You're placing each of these uh, unit stories okay. um, at a particular height based on. Can you take a section through this um, yeah. uh, while I'm t talking? You're placing them at the right height that they should be because you know the whole site is is sloping, but you're placing them on. A certain story. So let's say it's story one, um, and yes. so some are, you know, at least probably one of them is at the zero of the story one or, or close to that. The other ones could be five feet, ten feet, thirty feet, you know, um, off from that. But their home story is story it's one, story and one. which allows you then to show it in that symbolic way. But if you were to do a true cut, you know, horizontally cut, you know, you would see just the the earth um, mm -hmm. for some of that. Uh, and so that distinction, a lot of users are not real clear. There is an option when you're placing walls, particularly, but it, it does apply to other elements for symbolic representation, where you just say, hey, there's a wall, just show it with, you know, what it's made of brick or it's made of this or that, just show it. I don't really care about the height, just give me a symbol that's easy to understand. On the other hand, particularly when you have sloped things and you want to see where things are, you know, connecting, then you want to cut through and that's projected. And that's the option to say, cut through at a particular height and show me what's at that height. But in this case, that would be, I wouldn't say counterproductive, it would just not help to communicate. So those, they're both valid, but symbolic is necessary here. Um, yeah. One question that we haven't gotten to, which I think is very relevant, you have independent buildings with the walls actually separate from each other for, you know, for legal and structural and stuff. Sometimes you're gonna have party, you know, situations where it's really townhouses with shared party walls. Have you had any projects like that? And if you have, how do you deal with it? Yeah, so um, at the beginning, Tracy mentioned that we had that uh, commercial, um, the bays on the bottom, and there was a four unit apartment at the top, and that apartment is an exact example of that. So all of the walls, the demising walls, were all on the site, and the units, the floor plan really was just the interior elements, or so it was the stairs, it was any interior walls within the unit, not counting the demising. So it was kind of a everything 
that was not a wall. I don't know. <laughs> the dividing wall. The contents the, versus the it container. Was the, exactly. <laughs> it was the contents, not the container. Um, so we did do um, an apartment building that way. Mm. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so essentially, what you have to think cleverly is what's repeated and what's not. And just like the the one off, you know, wall with a window versus a wall with a door in you know a certain case, um, you know, some things are not modules. Some things are the containers for the modules. Um, yeah, I, I will say we have ongoing debates in the office about this. About it, at what point does it make sense to make it a nested module because it repeats so often, and you want to control it just once, or or just keep individual instances of it on the site file. And yeah, and we often too will discuss, you know, at what point does it make sense to build it just a couple elements up on the site? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there are some related questions. So I'm going to answer again. When you have a project stepping down the hill, how do you show the floor plans for, say, the first floor? We've just gone through that with the symbolic thing. I will say there's another option because this person asked, do you show cut planes every four feet or so? So you could potentially have a view of, let's say, if we these are units A, B, and C, but there's well, I'm going to call them one through seven because you have, you know, uh, yeah. and the one and seven are independent, and two through six or whatever those are, or maybe it's two through five, um, are repeats. So you could literally have a drawing, a view of unit type one cut at a certain height, a view of unit two cut at a different height, unit three at a different height. Now these would all be essentially separate uh, cropped views of the model. And you yeah, could yeah. put them, assemble them on a layout sheet, essentially side by side in a way that would look quite similar. And you would then use, um, you would then potentially use projected. So you're literally cutting at a certain height for each one of them and splicing them essentially to look like they're all at the same level uh, yeah. in certain yeah, split level yeah so in certain split level conditions uh, or designs it would absolutely be appropriate here i don't know that it would be helpful it might be you know, more trouble than it's worth um but it there is a nasser says the curtain wall does not work in symbolic like a regular wall so yeah. in the case of a curtain wall context, maybe you do have to do this with a cut plane at a different height and actually mm -hmm. sort of symbolically represented on the on the layout. Um, so the buffer, what how much of a buffer do you use between these? Um, so if you can open up the story settings. Yep. Uh, so I use five feet. Yeah, so the main thing is you were finding that if you were adjusting, hey, the, the, the story to story height from 10 feet to 10 feet six or something like that, you didn't want it to be pushing other parts of the building around. So yeah, there has to be enough of that. Around. Yeah. Yeah. And it, um, we often will set our, our base elevations. You know, these days I feel like it's usually around nine foot ceilings are nice. So we may just set all the ceilings at nine and then maybe some grow a little bit, maybe some get reduced a little bit, but then it kind of, it's, it's in a margin of, you know, a few inches instead of, it's not like, you know, we're, we're gaining four or five feet mm -hmm. um, ever on a unit height. Um, so uh, Alexis makes a point, not sharing walls may be a good thing for condominiums where structural ownership needs to be defined. Certainly, Archicad is flexible. You, you do what is going to help you with your design and with your legal requirements, et cetera. Um, IFC file, uh, how does it look when the houses are placed on the same story? So have you been working with structural uh, consultants and sending out IFC? Not for these uh, residential projects. Mm -hmm. The only time we've worked with someone um, and gone back and forth with IFC was a, a structural engineer for um, a commercial project. So, mm -hmm. okay. That so, <laughs> yeah. So, Let I mean, IFC, I mean, I'll just say that this is only one of the challenges of IFC. So, for those of you who don't know, IFC is the format that you would use to communicate with Revit structure or other structural programs. You want an intelligent building model that contains not just here's a surface and here's another surface, but what is this made of? Um, and the ability to even say, just show me the core. I want to send over the core. They don't need to see the cladding um, uh, of these walls. 
uh, but for example in Revit sometimes they will put in extra stories for framing or between other stories and that can make things go haywire when you're trying to exchange files back and forth because they have more stories than you do, you know, and how do they get uh, aligned? So there is coordination that, that is required and probably each situation, there could be different variations for how you're gonna export, whether it's all at once or in pieces, uh, you know, things like that. Um, how do the cars enter the garages with such a steep drive? Very creatively, <laughs> carefully, yeah. Um, we do have a pretty steep uh, slope on this. It's, it's under the city, maximum of 20% um, and, and it's, it, the driveways are warped it, we have about uh, 20 24 25 feet of backup so in that area it gets kind of warped and that's just how hillside yeah. homes work unfortunately it's a, a little piece of San Francisco here in LA <laughs> yeah, well do you so do you have um oh, okay so you're you're sort of going up and then flattening up and flattening a little bit is that yeah, it, it, they they warp to go flat um, and you'll actually see so we've been working with the structural engineer the other the other tricky part is these these units are so complex um, just because they're such tight packages and, and getting the structural to work um, there's often a moment frame involved or two or double stories you know to get a, an opening like this on such a small facade but he actually so this is like I said this project is in construction documents so please forgive anything that's obviously still working out. Um, but the engineer for this project needs this portion of the slab to be structural. And so we've been working back and forth with them in 3D, showing him that like, this is what we can do, you know, in our model to make the, the driveway work. Um, and we've figured out a way to kind of warp the structural slab. To build up on top of that. And then yeah. to build up on top for the driveway on this portion. So and for example- say warp it, so this is, this is a, a mesh so um, the, the driveway is built with a mesh right now, um, and the unit has, I believe these are roofs um, that are kind of pixelated pieces. Oh, you actually are using roofs there. Did you use a mesh to roof conversion? Um, I did not. Uh, the, so the, the roof portions are actually part of the units down below, because remember, we're trying to standardize um, the way all units look. So these pieces are part of the module, this first floor module, as you can see, and this is actually built on the site. So our driveway is built on the site, and we're trying to just figure out how to kind of merge the, the two pieces of information. And we're, that's something we're still kind of working through. Um, but so this, this just, project is in process, I uh, believe, right? It is. Yeah. It is. It's, it, we're, we're working on construction documents and kind of coordinating with all the different consultants right now, you know, what are the finished floor elevations and getting kind of that set and then what civil can do for the driveway and structure can do for their components. So it's a very yeah. complex project. <laughs> yeah. Have you, um, have you used the mesh to roof tool at all? We have, I haven't, no. Okay. Actually, yeah, so we let, thought about that. <laughs> so let me explain it just for every benefit of everybody. Um, the mesh tool has a, of course, is very powerful for doing terrain. That's its primary application. Um, and you can change the grading points, uh, whether it's earth or concrete or, you know, a path or a road, you can change them freely. Or of course, you, you can have contour lines where you have a bunch of them all at one level. And it will create the triangulation that makes a continuous surface. One of the limitations of the mesh tool is that it can't create something with a uniform thickness. It basically has a some surface uh, elevations, but the bottom is going to be a flat base. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, and there are variations you can have. Actually, the top be flat and the underneath be uh, have variations. But um, if you want to have something with a uniform thickness, let's say like uh, you were paving it with bricks or blocks you know, mm -hmm. following that, um, or gravel, or, you know, other things like that. Well, then it can be convenient to create a, a series of roofs. So the roof tool, of course, has a uniform thickness, and it can be any, you know, whether it's flat or on an angle. If you use the mesh to roof goodie, which is a free tool available um, in the design menu, um, uh, it will basically create a series of roofs 
to follow the grade of the train mesh. So in a case like this, if you actually had a little piece of train that was warped, you know, that, that sort of started here and went to wherever it needed to be, you could convert those into little shards or pieces of roof that had a uniform thickness, if that's useful. Certainly there are times when it would be. Yeah, the uh, one thing that I've noticed too, working with the, these modules and, and such a complex project with different levels, the one tool that really is not your friend, unfortunately, is a roof tool. <laughs> um, it's really hard to control whether it's showing, it's not showing, is it above, is it below? It doesn't, it doesn't behave very well. Um, slabs are generally pretty good and mesh is actually quite good as well. So anytime that I can use a mesh or a slab over a roof, I, I will. And you were talking about this and you know, my workaround to, to be able to use meshes is I, I will actually- from here. No. Go, oh, go ahead. This okay. Yeah, go ahead. Dragging a copy down six inches and solid element operating down. So that's that's how I have done that. I, oh, I was going to say I could have sworn Eric. I thought you taught us that ages ago, but maybe oh. Mackenzie <laughs> came up with it on her own too. No, no, I, I, I have. I have shared that as an alternative thing, but when I saw your little pieces of roof, I thought it made me think of the mesh to roof, which yeah. certainly has some cases. Um, so some other questions. So top topography, um, did you bring this in with point clouds, laser scanning, or you know survey? What, where did the actual topo come from? Um, <laughs> our mouse, no. <laughs> um, we will bring in um, the survey in, PDF or DWG, yeah. it's 2D drawing, and we will actually trace and put the topo on. Um, so we, we build it all with a mesh, and it's it's not imported at all. We we typically okay. for these projects though they're they're pretty much the site is more or less leveled, so it's not like it's a extremely complex thing. You don't have to we aren't retaining any of the existing structure, the existing wall. So it's usually pretty simple and a, a general topo across the site. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'll just make the point that in urban contexts, you know, things, you know, DWG stuff w works well. Uh, if you're talking about, hey, you have this piece of land out there that never been really properly surveyed or whatever, then LIDAR data and, and things, you know, w would probably make more sense. But here, you know, you're going to have existing surveys that you're going to work with. Um, there are some questions about construction things, you know, from the architectural perspective as opposed to Archicad perspective. So, for example, um, how are the exterior walls finished in between the units? And um, let's see, are the small unit designs actually attached like townhouses, even if they are structurally independent? Um, and then how do you choose to handle the exterior shell of the building when a unit that is used over and over again as many different exterior wall conditions? So that's actually a little bit of Archicad practice. The other two are more like the design. Yeah, so um, in construction, often when you're building these, I think you, they will end up building one and build maybe another flat and crane it into place um, so that you can get that condition. And it's it has a type X, it's one hour rated partition. We, yeah, it's gotta have a, a fire rating and a waterproofing cladding on it. Um, and then it gets flashed on all sides. So they're not, they have room to move independently, but we do try to protect that cavity as much as possible. And it can range anywhere from four to six inches apart for these taller buildings are, you know, six, sometimes eight inches. Um, but they are. So, so, you have, so you have these, um, the, the two walls are for the units are four to six inches apart, typically. Mm -hmm. In between, is that an air cavity or is there actually, no, it's, it's an air, air. cavity. Okay, so it's air. Air. Each each wall each wall then is um, uh, then uh, finished almost as if it was a totally exposed wall. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and uh, what happens when it goes underground? I mean, do you have uh, uh, you know down below grade? Is that filled with something? Um. Actually, they. They the concrete can be poured side by side as long as there is a slip joint uh, between it. So um, this is retaining that, back here. Um, yeah, we can clean up Oops. that joint there. Yeah, this joint is what I'm trying to show yeah. you. So there's a there's usually a gap here, and it's filled with something absorbent. Actually, actually I, I think <laughs> it, it will it will be a probably a sheet metal 
um, plate or something. We're, we're still working on the details, but <laughs> mm -hmm. something along those lines. They can touch, but they can't be connected. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Uh, by the way, we've had a bunch of comments from saying awesome work. Uh, Craig writes awesome work TSA. So your, okay. uh, your <laughs> initials there and, and uh, just great presentation. So everybody, you know, certainly you're sharing a lot. I uh, want to thank you for being generous. We're not finishing right now. I just want to make sure I get that in there that everybody's being very, very positive about it. Um, another question that's more architectural. Why use roof in the floor when there is the ramp? Oh, actually, that's more of an Archicad thing. Would it be smarter to use the morph tool and make an object? Um, you know, I'm just going to say there are probably many different ways to do things. So yeah. uh, somewhat the context and what you're comfortable with. That's the great thing about Archicad is literally there are a, a million ways to do the same thing. Yeah. So whatever works, we, we try a lot of things and we're like, even I've been using the program for since Archicad 16, 17, 16, when I started yeah. that it was, I've been using it regularly since then. And there are still things that I'll open a dialogue box and I thought, oh my gosh, I had no idea that checkbox even existed. Um, so <laughs> they're still learning. I, I, mm -hmm. I will say that uh, sometimes the decision is made for communication purposes, and I know that we have gone back and forth with lots of views of the model with the structural engineer in this case, and uh, the nice thing about the roof is it's really flat and easy to read, and and it, it sort of translated well into structural language. We could talk about slabs and things, so in that case, I think for our purposes in, in communicating with the structural engineer, that was a good tool for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, funny comment from Todd Hotchkiss saying, where do you find the really small guys to finish this gap wall? <laughs> That's on the contractor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so if you have units that are identical except for the finishes, um, you know, so you've got this uh, situation where um, the unit is really the same, but you're painting it a different color. Um, what, yeah. what do you do with that? <laughs> Big problem. <laughs> that is. We uh, we're just grappling with that on another project, um, and uh, at the moment, we're we're just simply calling it out as a note that if you look at the model, they've all got the same color on it, but um, we're either using a fill in the elevation or a um, or a a note to address it. But it, it is one of the the interesting limitations and unfortunately from my perspective it does push you to a more monochromatic or uh consistent. consistent a project because it's so much easier to document using this this module process the other way to go i think would be to peel off that wall or that surface and treat it as we we're talking about either as a nested module or a, um, something on the site that was unique mm -hmm. right all right yeah i guess yeah, you potentially, let's say you have a, this four-story unit and the whole facade is going to be slightly different from one to another to another. Now, all of a sudden, you have to add another four stories, another four stories, another four stories. Um, now, there is the option. I mean, uh, you've been demonstrating how quick and easy it is. Um, well, uh, let's say how much faster and easier uh, it is as opposed to quick and easy. Um, to have the units down uh, down below, uh, but you certainly can still save out um, MOD files, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or or have variations that that would be um, saved externally. So that that maybe there's some exploration there where you literally select all the walls, all the all the exterior walls. Maybe you put them on a separate layer, exterior front mm -hmm. facade walls or something like that, right. for th this unit and save that as an MOD file, and then you change the color of it, and you save another MOD, and you change the color a third time, you save it as another MOD. Now, very quickly, you've got several that could be slipped into the site, depending upon whether it's you know red, green, or blue um, yeah. sort of thing. So it, it wouldn't be integrated in the same way. Of, <laughs> yeah, and then, you, and then you, and then you move, move a window, window in one. and. <laughs> Yeah, so there's going to be some trade-offs with management, but um, that would be a, one option. All yeah. right, um, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, what if the building was modeled bespoke and modules were used for interior layouts? Would the file sizes be dramatically bigger? Not sure if it would make much difference. I don't, I don't think that the fact that it's got the exterior walls in it makes much difference. It's, yeah, um, you'd still have to actually build those exterior walls seven times. So actually you'd be building them more. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's actually probably a Graphisoft question. Is it more computing power to, to remember and link it to the module or to store the actual object? Okay, so this little technical note for clarification. When you have a module placed into a project, whether it's from the negative story or you know uh, an outside file, those elements are live. They're in your model. They take ju up just as much space as if you selected something and you said repeat it five times or a hundred times. They are literally the same data structures. There's a control that says you can't modify this because it is a part of a module that's located somewhere else but the file size is going to be based on how many elements there are. Okay. I know ARCHICAD generally is pretty efficient, um, but you know, the more elements and the more data you put in, you know, the more units, et cetera, it's just going to get bigger. Um, now, in the case where you're doing a concept model, let's say you had a, a site model that had 500 buildings on it, um, mm -hmm. You might actually take the buildings um, in certain cases, let's say that you had 10 units and you were sprinkling them around different variations, you could save them as objects. And the objects, then, then that file would be relatively small. It essentially is like saying, place a chair here, a chair there, a chair there, except the chairs are buildings. Mm -hmm. The file will just be pretty small because it's just saying put 500 elements on there. But the 3D model, of course, could be enormous. If, it, uh -huh. if it's got a lot of detail. So there's a difference between file size um, and uh, 3D model size. And essentially the more detail you put in, the more you have there. It was a question, but do you have furniture in here? I mean, I've seen certainly basic furniture. How far do you go with your interior modeling in a case like this? Uh, depends how big our fee is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as far as the client wants us to and we've agreed to, but it's you you can, it, it all translates nicely as part of that module. Yeah, we will typically do a, at least a first stab at putting all the um, lighting and electrical at locations, not necessarily specifics on the, the item. And, you know, sometimes if we have time, um, we'll build in all the baseboards, um, all yeah. those kind okay. of things. Okay. Um, what, what's the standard hardware you have in the office, you know, that's able to handle these things? Uh, computers and computers? <laughs> I don't know. Can we, can, we, can we get back to you on that one? I, it's, uh, right. I, I will say I do try to keep as current as possible and, and every, you know, couple years we upgrade and we're always trying to make sure we have a good uh, graphics card <laughs> going. All right, so you have 16 gigs of sixteen gigs of RAM, which is sort of pretty average these days. You're on Windows 7, so you're actually not yeah. on the latest Windows. No, we definitely are um, not there. Yeah, yeah but, anyway. all right. Here's right. an interesting tech idea can you use the graphic override for the different color facade problem by using the rules is part of unit A to override the outside surface? That wow, is a great excellent thought. idea. I will definitely try that. All right. So, so let's just talk for 30 seconds about what a graphic override is. A graphic override is a temporary change of the appearance of something based on a rule. And you can say, well, right now I want to see the walls see through. So, you know, just make all walls have a glass material. Okay, that's just a, a particular override. Or I want to show, um, you know, well, different contexts. But you can make those rules, they're pretty darn sophisticated. I'm sorry, um, well, I'm going to quickly just, I'm dying to right. know. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's see what you got here. So um, as you're doing it, uh, I'm going to try not to distract you, but I want to explain it for those people who you know this was added into, is it okay. ARCAD 20? Um, we're in 21 now, this, this file. Well, 20 is when graphic overrides were introduced. 21, they've made them a little bit, a little bit more sophisticated, but the concept started in 20. 
Okay, so the, the caveat is right now I have named them all. Um, but you have master, you have the hot link. So because the door and window schedule is not quite working right now with that glitch, I have named all of the B units type B. Um, we'll try it with unit one at least, I think. Or let me try it with yeah. unit two. And let's go um, add his all walls, add is module any. Whoa, oh, oh. look at that. <laughs> hmm. Well, you can do ors, I think. Uh, does it have the ability to do or? Well, but I want to do by ID, correct? ID, master, master ID. There we go. That's what I want. And let's go remove that one. Contains, I'm going to say O2. I'm going to go rename some real quick. Um, and so mm -hmm. we can trigger just those. Why don't you turn it to yeah, so um, as you're doing it, I'll just ex yeah, explain. Yeah. So we're basically saying in what condition should this apply? And we can turn it on or off at will, but we're basically saying out of the whole building, which element should be affected? And so we're saying all the walls, and you, of course you could say the walls that are on an exterior layer, so maybe you're not going to affect the interior, um, so you can be restrictive that way. But all the walls on the outside of the building that are part of a particular unit, we're going to override a color. Now, of course, maybe you have it in two tones or three tones, so you'd want to do some more controls with layers or naming of the walls, uh, etc. But ultimately, if this works, we could at least say temporarily, and in fact, for any rendering, you know, we could do it. Just yeah, say, uh, yeah. so that I want to give credit here to Stephen Bloom, Stephen, that's, yeah. uh, or Stefan Bloom for Thank this idea. You. Yeah, that, that could be brilliant. Um, uh, okay. All right, so there are some other questions. Um, okay, could the paint tool be used to paint individual surfaces on each module? No, because the module elements have certain attributes just in general. It's made of a building material, it has certain skins, you know, etc., and it has a certain appearance, and that's locked to the module. Oh but my graphic God. This is amazing. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So but graphic overrides, yeah, graphic overrides are so powerful. Look at that. So you could be more restrictive and say just the ones on the street the, side of the building, you know, yeah, for yeah, you could just right. make a layer for that, I think. So yeah, I, I made the uh, the graphic override for this one, for example, I use the master hotlink master ID. So it's calling um, yeah, calling the ID, master ID of the module. Great. That's fantastic. Oh my yeah, gosh, we I did we've been pondering that for you have no idea. <laughs> I'm so glad we attended this webinar. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so um, that's great. Let me just uh, see, since we've got other questions, one thing I wanted to look at was your template, and you know, we may run out of time with that, but let's just see, there are a few maybe questions we can finish up um, this. What, what do you use for your electrical items like switch plates and lights? The defaults are to pad objects. Okay, so some things are 2D only, some things are 3D. Um, and you're just using the standard library because it's worked yep. well enough for you. Yep. Yeah. So we just use the regular outlets and add some text. Nothing, nothing okay. fancy. All right. Um, okay. There is something CAD image coverings. So someone mentioned that. So CAD image makes some great tools, and I know you're using the Keynote tool, right? Yeah, we use Keynote. So we should take we should take a look at that either in this file or maybe your other file if, if it's yeah. in use there uh, okay. more. Um, so CAD Image, uh, based in New Zealand, uh, used to be the distributor for Archicad there. That company or Archicad sales were taken over by the Australian distributor who bought bought them out. But CAD Image still exists as a developer for Archicad tools, variety of things, generally well crafted, well supported. Um, CAD image coverings does some things where you can say, hey, I want to cover the wall up to this level with a certain 
thing and up at that level, different thing. And it basically allows you to do tiles or stucco or this or that um, systems. Uh, right. But that's not what you're using here. Um, yeah. But it could be, you know, just know that it exists. But keynotes is something that is um, pretty interesting. Show us a little bit about that. All right. So um, we kind of have a, a template of default notes, and we always add more, you know, as, as needed for each project. Um, and you can have, it's a regular note, you know, a, a text note. But it, when you bring in CAD image keynotes, it gives you a sample one. Um, and you can just add a note as needed, or you can add five notes, you know, you want them all listed here. And then what you do on the layout is uh, the key, the key is that these notes have to be on the plan, I believe, not on the layout. And then when you go to, um, whoops, cancel. Um, when you go to the layout, you, you put a schedule on and you can um, update and it will pull all the notes that you have on your plan as it's as, as visible in these views. Yeah, that's important. Only the ones that are placed on that layout. It's beautiful that way. So you have a right a fine tuned list per layout. So yeah, it's only the ones that are are directly noted. Yeah. So so it's definitely a a, a very powerful reporting tool um, and has some unique features that there's just no other way to do it. At least in terms of an automated uh, you know, reporting. Um, so the keynotes, just a, a couple other comments. So you can have standard notes that you import or use from project to project. You can have custom ones that you add to a specific project. Um, essentially, they can be managed um, using a, a spreadsheet uh, to just sort of create a tabular list of, you know, your note number and your short description and your longer description, et cetera. Um, but inside Archicad, you're not using a spreadsheet. You're using this little interface. The labels, the labels that you're putting, whether it's in plan or a section or uh, other types of views, have flexibility. Do you just want to have just the short number? Do you want to have the drawing note? You know, maybe it's two or three words or something like that. Um, and you can have multiple references there, as you can see, uh, that relate to that element. And these notes actually are can be independent or they can be based on the element. So you can say this wall has certain notes that describe it, and then it's up to you whether you want to label it or not, but it, it knows what it is. So those yeah. are all really good things about, you know, building information, modeling data using the keynote tool. Um, you know, Tim Ball has created an alternate way to, uh, to do yeah. reporting, yeah, I saw that. Um, which also essentially can report what, what the elements have but uh, you can't format it quite this way in terms of reporting. It won't automatically say, hey, if you add a, a, um, a drawing to the sheet, what extra notes should be added? You have to manually go and create a schedule that says, I only want to report things on this zone or this, you know, this or some other criteria. So there are limitations, but it's built into Archicad. This is something you have to pay a significant amount, a few hundred dollars a year, I think, for um, even per workstation, I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, and every time Archicad releases, a, or Gamasoft releases an update, you got to update your tools too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I think they're actually yeah. moving to the monthly. If I remember seeing last time that it was, yeah. it was now monthly, kind of like the Adobe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, Reed Ferguson asks, it seems like you might have had to do a fair amount of experimentations with Archicad to solve these documentation issues. So this is back uh, 20 minutes ago. So how does one account for this in your fee? So um, I guess a uh, question, are, are you just feeling like this is part of your office's learning curve and as you move along, you, you reap the benefit because things go faster and easier? Or do you actually tell your client, you know what, this is going to be pretty tricky and we're going to have to charge you more for um, for this? Well, to a certain degree, a little of both. Um, I think e with each project, we learn something and we try to go back and update our template uh, in whatever downtime we have so that we keep bringing that knowledge forward. And um, I, I actually, I don't, I have never explicitly discussed that with my clients at all. I just assume that that is part of our uh, trying to uh, keep the office um, providing the best service that we can. And also, 
saving time on our end so that we we can make money on the on the jobs uh but when we come to a project like we showed you that's on the hillside i knew that that was a complicated one both physically um to construct and also to document so i did um put a premium on that fee and our clients understood that because they knew it was a challenging site uh to begin with so um i didn't i don't think i explicitly told them that part of that premium was for documentation for us to figure out how to do it. But um, they also are invested in us having a, a clear set of documentation so that it can be built well. So I, I think, it, anyway, so far it's worked out. That's, that's great. And uh, yeah, I mean, certainly investing in your um, processes, you know, working out the most efficient way to do it will pay off handsomely as long as you're doing similar projects down the line yeah. you know obviously if, if if every project is like a unique thing like you know a, a geary project you know uh, well even then you know he's got his whole um uh, you know system for the the cladding you know yeah. and how all of that is handled um but yeah if you're going to do another multi-unit project which i'm sure you will um all of this was just going to become faster and faster. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, John Dunham says, "Can you zoom in on the keynote legend on the drawing sheet?" Um, yep, so uh, zoom in on, <laughs> on how it came out. So there are flexibility. There is flexible how you do it. It can do multiple columns. Um, you can, you know, change the indentation and the formatting. You know, there's a fair amount of flexibility. And you know, the really nice thing, in addition to just reporting exactly on what's on a sheet or of course for the whole project you can have one global one um, there uh, is uh, that it sensibly groups things and you know just the graphics are are pretty clear yeah um, and we did spend uh, a little bit of time in the office coming up with our uh, system for numbering it and and the headers and what made sense to us logically so uh, it is not a standard but it was something that we developed Mm -hmm. um, all right, I'm going to ask, uh, just do one more that's uh, related to this tricky stuff, and then I want to see your template at least for five minutes just to say what are you putting into the template for when you start a project. But this, how are the stairs or vertical circulation handled with the linking? Um, um, so that's yeah. a challenging thing. It is. So uh, one of the, with the new stair and railing tool, it, it is a little bit trickier than it was before because I we had we had really gotten down the old stair tool. So um, we luckily they've made some updates. The, the arrow's now working right. So that's really helping a lot. Um, and let me see if I can just grab maybe a 3D view and you can see what we're working with. Um, and then I can show you some things about when they when we move up to the the site, things don't work quite as nicely. And that's one of the key reasons we really do need to take the documentation down on the, the story because it's not seeing the cut planes, even if they're manually put in, but that could also be um, user error. Let's see. So they, they do get built in just like any other project, um, and it all makes sense to each story. Um, so does, does that answer those questions? Are the, the trouble we've been having, for example, is when we go back up to the site, and on a, this is only the, an issue when it's such a dramatic sloping site. It doesn't happen that bad um, when it's a regular Project, but sometimes we have difficulty on how the stairs actually show up and they start overlapping even though they look perfectly fine down at the unit. So that, again, it's it's a new tool. We haven't completely figured it out. So some of you may be you know, ahead of us on that, <laughs> that learning curve. Um, but we've, we've tried to play around with it a lot and at, you know, at some point we just kind of gave up. If there's a reference that there's a stair there, they can find the details about the stair on the, the floor plan. Right, okay. Um, Related question, do you create specific site stories as well? So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously you've got... Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, how does that work? Because... Um, 
that, I mean, frankly, we we have one, two, three, four. You know, you have to link. Let's see, we have to link. You know, all the first floors, or we choose to link all the first floors on the first floor, all the second floors on the second floor, all the third floor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are completely, they can be completely independent of the modules. The modules can sit wherever they need to sit as long as they're placed on each story. So we really don't worry too much about um, where they're located. If All right. So actually, so can, you, can, you, can you just show on the first floor, let's say, for example, select one of the modules on the lower part and show mm -hmm. the module settings, which will show the elevation? Um, and then select one of the other ones and show its elevation. So this elevation is negative one foot six for the first unit. Whereas this m next one is three foot 11 and a quarter. Okay, so basically when you're putting in a, a, a module in multiple times, each time that you put it in, you can say, where is it in, where is it on the plan? Where yeah. is it in 3D space, like up or down? Is it rotated? Is it mirrored? Mm -hmm. All of those right. things are options which essentially keep the design constant, but just move it in space. So yeah, right. it, Archicad is very flexible that way. And, and even when you mirror it, one of the things that you didn't point out is that it will actually keep the, the text you know, readable. It won't be like a, a mirror. That. I love that about it. Yeah. Um, so see if I just, I mirrored it here. All the text still is readable. It's still in 3D at the same elevation. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. So let's take a look at your, um, uh, you know, maybe take five minutes to look at your module, I'm sorry, your template. I know you started with master template a while back and then you developed your own, um, you know, uh, well, just made it your own. Yeah, um, yeah. I think Tracy started with uh, Master Template years ago, and it's since morphed into what we needed to be. But it was a great starting point. So, so um, we actually have multiple templates in the office. One of them is just for regular projects that don't have these repeating modules. So if we know that it's going to be a unique single-family dwelling or whatever, we don't we don't start with this multifamily uh, or a small lot template. Um, but for the multifamily projects, we do have it set up so that by default, we have in some base um, types, unit types and stories. Um, and we save, you know, a handful of views. And we, we save all the some basic 3D views that are filtered. So just unit A, just unit B, just unit C. And so we have all those kind of things, those really basic elements um, set up already for us. And as long as you draw more or less in this, Right. Site location. We, you know, we have the site and we actually use uh, grid lines to as our property lines and setbacks so that they're visible in 3D. So when you saw on the other projects anywhere that we had a PL, that was actually a grid line that is is live. So if we were to move it on the site, it would move it in the documentation too. So it's that's really kind of a, a nice thing that we can see it in 3D and 2D. And um, I mean, it's even in literally three dimensions if you look we have the, the base property lines on line built in. So. All right. That's great. Now let's, um, you have some legends um, there. Uh, I'm particularly interested in those just because one of the things in master template was the idea uh, of creating legends that you could potentially use as a uh, graphic explanation. This is what uh -huh. this wall type looks like, but also can be eye dropped. So you've got these, Groups. Right. We, we, per view type, um, we have them grouped and some just our, our basic walls. And this is actually just out of one of our recent projects. I was just updating this. Um, and actually we use, so we use favorites pretty heavily. So I, all of these, um, you know, a lot of our document base documentation types, um, doors and windows, we have some base, we have some furniture, we have some walls, we have zones, all of our area calcs. We try to keep our favorites really up to date and working so that, you know, if someone needs to make something to fit into one of our schedules, ideally it's already a favorite and it's, you know, they don't have to question what, what story is it going on or, I mean, what layer is it going on and, and that sort of thing or what, what the label should look like. Okay. Um, 
so do you set things up for renovation filters? Uh, like how much are you doing remodels? Obviously the, uh, those two projects we were looking at today are new, uh, but how much do you do remodel projects? We, we do oh, quite a few. We do yeah. quite a few. So this, whenever we're doing small lots, you're pretty much leveling the site and starting from scratch. So this, this project doesn't have a lot of those kind of things based in the base drawing. Um, but in our legends, I think in the, the regular legend for our regular file, it does give you the options for the demoed wall and that sort of thing. Yeah. And we actually, yeah. Th this was an amazing uh, innovation. The renovation <laughs> filter, I, I find it extremely useful for our remodel projects. Yeah, I've actually, uh, we've, we've even added some to help. Before graphic overrides were a thing, um, sometimes we would use the renovation filters to override all lines to be solid, for example. So for RCPs, when you're having trouble um, looking up, uh, a lot of things want to be dashed, so slabs, that sort of thing. Um, you can use the renovation filter to override all lines to be solid so that the slabs look solid instead of dashed and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Another way to use renovation filters Mm -hmm. uh, can we look at your layers um, for a moment and just see how you have that organized? Sure. We use just the kind of the default uh, naming convention, and we are we try to be extremely good about layer combination. So at any given point, I think no drawings should ha or no saved views should have a custom. So if you're starting to make adjustments on something you, that needs to be updated in the layer combination, and of course it will update in all the views that have that same layer combination. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so you've got, I guess, the, the names of the layers following sort of common um, disciplines, uh, but you're not abbreviating like the old days where it was only four letters and stuff like that. Up at the top, you had some some extra ones. So front yeah. yard fills, hardscape. So those all link back these to are, schedules that we have to have for city of LA um, plan check. We have to show the hardscape amounts and landscape amounts. And so those all feed back into schedules we have set up already. But and we never is there a reason why you put them in, uh, you know, as an asterisk at the front? Um, and uh, because we wanted them easily accessible. We, we found out that the asterisk makes them all jump to the top. And so um, basically the, the, the things that are independent or um, set project specific that are kind of our notes or things that we ch test out. So it's like the drafting, the junk, that kind of thing. We always will put it in our, kind of like our private layers up at the top and they won't go on our, uh, our base set and, of layers. And just, uh, they never show up in a in a layer combination. Right. They're not things that ever show up on any drawing that you want to see. They're I kind see. of house housekeeping right. uh, items, right. let's say. Okay. So would you put would hardscape and landscape have three D elements or just two D fills or what? We just use fills for now. They're just for calculation. We do have we have real layers. If you have actual landscaping you want to show that's that's going to show up on your landscape plan. All those things have real layers. This is just simply for fills that feed into calculations um, for various entities or reason. Okay. Um, do you use complex profiles much? That was a question. And you know, yes. if if so, Absolutely. show us uh, a little bit of what you've got to find. Gosh, I hope they're in here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we have all kinds of foundations. Um, we actually. We, we model in all of our ductwork, and I know there is an MEP modeler, and we literally just invested in that. So I haven't figured it out yet, but um, we were modeling in a lot of our ductwork. We model in most of our framing um, structure, that kind of thing, to catch, you know, anywhere that a duct is running through a large beam that is not going to happen. That, <laughs> I mean, we try to catch all that stuff if we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, do you have the framing in the walls so that when you cut a section, It'll have framing in it. We don't do walls. We'll only we typically only do um, major. So we'll do um, posts. Anytime there's a post or a steel column, but it's mostly just the floor framing. Because on, especially on these little projects, uh, it's very challenging to make sure that the structure and the mechanical systems um, can work 
uh, in concert with each other. So it, generally speaking, the walls aren't as important, but uh, it's really important that we know um, where the beams and the joists are, which direction the joists are running. So we know whether we can penetrate them or we're running in the joist space so on. So this particular view you brought up is one of your saved ones for a unit and it's HVAC. So let's just take a look at the view settings that, that allowing us to see. Um, so you're Wait, showing core. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, we have layer combinations for all kind of HVAC and structural because that's really the, the point that we're trying to get these little tight packages to work together. Um, our dimension plans and 3D like this um, show core only. And then we have separate pen sets. So basically everything goes light. And just the just the elements that we're wanting to focus on are color um, or, you know, wireframe even. And that's set up. The wireframe component is set up in the layer combination. Um, we have a specific model view option to help override some of the different elements um, and graphic overrides. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And and so in that layer combination, um, can you just open up the layer combination, the active one? Uh, I assume that you've got the walls on a wireframe layer? Yeah. yeah, so walls, exterior, interior, and low are all on wireframe. Okay, so just, just a point for those of you who haven't worked with that, layer combinations, of course, turn layers on and off. They can lock certain layers, you know, property lines, grid grids, things like that. And there is a, a much less used option to make layers wireframe where you can see through them. And uh, that is that little 3D thing next to the eyeball. And if you click on it, it switch toggles back and forth between solid or wireframe. So that's what they're using to get that. Um, nowadays, you could get a similar thing by using a graphic override. Mm -hmm. um, there are some subtle differences between it. This certainly works perfectly for what you're doing here. Um, so uh, I think we've covered most of the questions. Probably there's a few that I missed. Uh, if any of you have follow-up questions you'd like either me to answer or for me to relay to uh, Tracy and, and Mackenzie, uh, just send them to support at bobro.com. Uh, Tracy and Mackenzie, this has been awesome. Um, just really enjoyed it. And I know, uh, you know we kept everybody's rapt attention um, here. And uh, I'm so pleased to see how far you've taken things. Um, you know, it's always good to see how these principles play out in, in real challenging practice. Um, and uh, you've been very smart about it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing where it goes uh, now that you've got the option for doing your color coding with the, um, oh, the graphic I override. <laughs> Fantastic. Very Fine. excited Thank about that. You again, yes. to whoever. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so just to, to finish up, um, this will be uh, this recording should be available on the ARCAD user website for the next month um, at no charge. I mean, this is what I'm doing every month, having a, an interview with a an advanced user like Tracy and, and Mackenzie. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer, any of you who are on this or watching the recording saying, hey, you know, I, I've got some good stuff. Uh, we don't, uh, I'm definitely uh, sort of taking uh, people's names and putting them on a list and we'll be sort of seeing who goes in which months. And sometimes we may do two. In other words, if, if, a, if a firm or a project doesn't need two hours, you know, we'll, we'll spend half an hour, we'll spend 45 minutes on one and pair you up with someone else. Um, if you'd like to support the work that I'm doing with the ARCAD user, please sign up as a silver or gold member. You'll find information on uh, the ARCAD user site. Uh, you know, a small monthly fee will help fund my efforts and allow me to devote time to it. Um, and uh, we're, we do share um, some downloads. So I know you've got your, um, little presentation that sort of summarizes the uh, the workflow of the um, hotlink modules. Uh, I asked you if you had anything that you might be able to share, like it's a BIMX or something. Did, do you have anything you'll be able to do, do you think, Tracy? Oh, I think we can make a BIMX available of this uh, the presentation file that we showed. Uh, that, that'll be awesome. I think people okay. would appreciate just being able to, you know, 
move through it. And of course, in BIMX, you can actually s select elements and sort of see some information about them. Um, if you create it as a BIMX docs, then they'll be able to see the, you know, the, the, the layouts as well. Um, have you been working with BIMX much? Um, we, we do have, we've used that and actually that file we've exported a few times with the information. So we don't use it very often. It's always if like a client is interested, but, um, yeah, we certainly know how to do it. We, we offer it, actually, to our clients, but we haven't had that many clients take us up on it, interestingly. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, maybe that's going to change over time as people become more aware of, of that. So thank you again. Let me just see if there's any final comments here. Wow. So um, two incredibly talented ladies. There you go. Um, and... Uh, Michael Fain says, next time in, L in L.A., I'll drop in and say good day. Um, so we're, we're, Ray, he writes, good day. I think he must be in Australia. Um, Buzz says, uh, thanks to you and thanks to me and, and TSA for sharing this. And thank you. Um, Lars says, could the next one be one to two hours earlier? Well, Lars, the problem is, I know it's late in Europe. I'm assuming you're in, in Europe with that with a name like Lars Boarding. Um, but if you're in Australia, this started at 6 a.m. So um, if it was earlier, we'd lose all the people in Melbourne and, and et cetera. So, um, but lots of thank yous, great topic, excellent presentation, really great, thanks, you know, wonderful presentations. So um, Durval asked, where can I find that Keynotes tool? So CAD image, if you do C-A-D image, CAD image, um, you do a web search, you'll find their website. It's probably cadimage.co.nz or nz. Um, and then they have products, keynotes being one of them. Um, okay. Um, and Rick Skorik says uh, he's in Tokyo and he says 5 a.m. is early enough for me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, Lewis says, How did you do the wireframe layer change? I did show that a minute ago or have them show it. It's under the um, uh, layer settings. And then if you click on a layer, the little 3D image there, click on it once or twice. And you'll see it flip back and forth between wireframe and solid. And when you save that as a layer combination or as part of your layer combination, just like is a layer turned on or off, it also will remember is a layer wireframe or not. And so when you activate that layer combination, you get that um, option. Thank you. Thank so you. We'll be, I'll be back in a month with um, I'm not quite sure who's going to be on next time. Um, but it uh, should be some someone quite inspiring, I'm sure. Uh, so many of you out there, I mean, I'm, I'm just moved uh, so much with your generosity. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we were able to teach you something today with the graphic yeah. override. Or... Always, always learning. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Take care, Tracy and Mackenzie. So send me that file. We can, um, uh, you know, we can distribute or post and... Uh, I'll be I'll be in touch and let me know if there's anything else I can help you with. Like maybe we can spend some time on that uh, just that story moving thing and see if if there's uh, maybe a little trick I can teach you there. Great, awesome. We'd love that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Take bye care bye. then. Bye bye everybody. Just gonna copy a couple of things here. <laughs>